Welcome to our tutorial on the capital asset pricing model. We'll begin with explaining the model, giving you some background information. Then we will discuss in detail the CAPAM equation. Following that, we will talk about the assumptions behind the model. And the last item today is an exercise for you to test your knowledge. There are thumbnails in the video description if you would like to jump to a particular section. So let's get started with the CAPAM model. To understand the CAPAM model, we need to do a very quick recap of portfolio theory. Portfolio theory basically says that investors care about risk and return of um, stocks, bonds, and any risky asset, right? So let's say we have expected return here, our measure of return, and our measure of risk is the standard deviation of returns or return volatility. So there are many as stocks, bonds, etc., in the market, and what investors do, they try to come up with this efficient frontier. And when there is a risk free asset in the market, they connect it with this efficient frontier to find the tangency portfolio. Okay, so according to portfolio theory, this is what the investors should be doing to arrive at this optimal risky portfolio. Now, Capam says that okay. If everyone does this, so if everyone um, sort of engages in mean variance optimization and find the optimal risky portfolio, under certain assumptions, that optimal risky portfolio becomes the market portfolio. And market portfolio is a value-weighted portfolio of all risky assets in an economy, right? And because it is such a big portfolio that contains every asset that you can think of, it's very well diversified. And by diversification, we actually get rid of what's called firm-specific risk. So if you, if you think of uh, uh, this return volatility as total risk, it has two components, systematic risk and firm-specific risk, or sometimes called idiosyncratic risk. Okay. So by holding the market portfolio, we eliminate from specific risk. So then all we should care about is actually systematic risk. Then CAPAM says that, okay, we can think of a stock's beta as a measure of systematic risk, and then we should be rewarded for systematic risk in our portfolios, but not from specific risk. So according to CAPAM, actually the correct plot is expected return against beta, okay? And beta is our measure of systematic risk. So CAPAM says there's a linear relationship between a stock's expected return and beta. Again, the intercept here is the risk-free rate, so same as before. And while individual stocks lie below this line, which is called the capital market line, according to CAPAM, all the stocks will lie on what's called the security market line. And if they don't, there's an arbitrage opportunity and by uh, in competitive markets, such arbitrage opportunities will quickly be eliminated and the assets uh, would fall back onto the line pretty fast, okay? So this is the key idea behind the CAPAM model. It says that the optimal risk portfolio becomes the market portfolio, and because it is well diversified, um, the, what we should care is not the total risk, but systematic risk only. So based on these predictions, the CAPAM equation will look something like this. So according to CAPAM, a stock's expected return will have two components. So it will depend on the risk-free rate, okay, and it will uh, involve a premium, a risk premium. And this risk premium will depend on the stock's beta and what is called the market risk premium. Okay, so this is called the market risk premium. Why? What we have here, so this first term here, is the expected return on the market portfolio. And this is the risk free rate. So this is what the market earns in excess of the risk free rate. So for example, if the risk return is 3%, and if the market is market portfolio is expected to generate 8%, market risk premium is 5%, okay? 
So like I said, according to Capam, there will be a linear relationship between a stock's expected return and its beta. And beta really captures the uh, sensitivity to stock market movements. So for example, if a stock has a beta of two, it means that if the market goes up by 1%, you expect, to go, you expect the stock to go up by 2%. But if the market goes down by 1%, then the stock will go down by 2%, right? So it is quite sensitive to market movements. Conversely, if you have a low stock beta, so let's say beta 0.5, now if the market goes up by 1%, the stock is expected to go up by only half a percent, which is not great, but then if the market goes down by a percent, the stock will only go down by half a percent, which is good, right? So this is sort of a lower variance in the returns, right? So that's, that's why a low beta stocks are less risky because they are less sensitive to market movements. Now, I would like to give you a practical example to employ uh, the CAPM equation. So let's say we are interested in a stock that has a beta of 1.49. Let's say the risk-free rate is 2.9%. And let's say the expected return on the market is 8.3%. So let's find the expected return for this uh, stock. So we have 2.9% plus 1.49 times 8.3% minus 2.9%. And we have actually a nice CAPAM calculator on our website, which does these calculations for you. It's very easy to use, and you can find the link in the video description. So we enter the beta, 149, the risk-free rate, 2.9%, and the market return is 8.3%, and we will get the answer as 10.95%. So the expected return for this stock is 10.95%, right? Now we've learned about the model, we've seen its equation. Let's move on to understanding the assumptions behind this model, okay? Like each model, CAPAM relies on a set of assumptions. This is necessary because the reality is complex. So if we don't make these assumptions, the models become uh, untractable. So I'll go over the uh, key assumptions of the standard version of the CAPAM. Some of these assumptions can be relaxed in various extended ver versions of CAPM, which is beyond our scope here. So the very first assumption is that investors act rationally in the sense that they don't make uh, silly mistakes or they don't uh, suffer from behavioral biases and that they are mean variance optimizers, which I have explained at the start. This all means that basically we act according to portfolio theory in the sense that we care about return volatility and expected return, and we know where the stocks are. So we try to come up with the efficient frontier and try to find the optimal risky portfolio, okay? So this is what we mean by mean variance optimization. The second assumption is important. It says that investors agree on the expected return and variance of each asset and covariances as well. So intuitively, what this means that we all agree on the location of these points, right? Think of them like maybe individual stocks and also the covariances between the pairs of stocks. And the reason we need this assumption is that if this assumption holds, we will all end up with the same optimal risk portfolio. This is sometimes known as homogeneous expectations. So for example, if we have heterogeneous expectations, we would disagree among each other we will disagree about the location of these points, and each of us then can end up with a different optimal risk portfolio. And then CAPM uh, wouldn't hold because, you know, the optimal risk portfolio wouldn't end up being the market portfolio, which the CAPM uh, predicts, okay? The next assumption is that uh, according to the model, all investors have a single investment period, for example, a year, but could be five years, 10 years. Doesn't matter as long as it's the same for everyone, okay? Again, this is, a, of course, not true in reality, but a simplifying assumption um, 
for the model. The next assumption says that all assets are tradable and perfectly divisible. Again, this is not strictly true because there are many assets that do not trade on organized exchanges. Think of human capital, which is a valuable asset, but that's not easily tradable on an exchange. This perfectly divisible assumption is probably uh, easier to justify nowadays because nowadays you can engage in what's called fractional trading. So you can actually trade fractions of a share, which in the past would be difficult, but nowadays actually brokerages are providing this service as a standard. Okay. The next assumption is again an important one. It says that investors are price takers. What this means is that no, in the, no single investor has the power to influence prices through their trades. Okay, this requires to be uh, requires the market to be sufficiently competitive, so that there are enough investors in the market such that big trades would would not create a price impact. Next one is about the risk free rate. So the standard version assumes that we can either lend or borrow as much as we like at the risk free rate. Again, this is not very realistic. You know, uh, we, I can't go to a bank and, uh, you know, ask to borrow a million dollars at the risk-free rate. Uh, but, you know, the, 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 this assumption is necessary for the uh, model to hold. There are extensions of the model, for example, which assume different lending and borrowing rates um, rather than a single one. Okay, so some of this can be relaxed in the extended versions. Another assumption is about short selling. Um, so in the standard version, short there's short selling is allowed and without limits. Again, this is not very realistic. Typically, you can't engage in uh, unlimited short selling. When you short sell an asset, you bet that its value will go down. Uh, and But if the asset's value actually keeps increasing, you would pretty much be forced to uh, close your position because you'll be suffering heavy losses. Okay. And the uh, final assumption is that there are no taxes and transaction costs. Again, this simplifies the mathematics uh, quite a bit. So we can actually introduce taxes into the model because, you know, in reality, there are taxes. Uh, but, you know, it just makes the model a bit less tra uh, tractable. And transaction costs exist in reality as well. Think about, for example, trading commissions and so on. Okay. So like I said, so these are the assumptions for the standard model. You can't relax all of these assumptions, but some of them can be relaxed in extended versions. Okay, in the final part of this tutorial, we have a small exercise for you to test your knowledge. And uh, the solution to this problem is again in the video description. There's a link to follow. Um, so try your hand at it and see if you can get uh, the correct answer. So we've got an investor, Daniel, who has identified the stock and he's quite interested in buying the shares, but he would like to know what would be the expected return on this stock given the following input. So we have a beta of 1.3 for the stock. The risk-free rate is 5% and expected return on the market portfolio is 8%. So what you need to do is to employ uh, the CAPM equation to find the expected return. Okay, that's all I wanted to cover uh, in this tutorial on uh, capital asset pricing model. I hope you have found it useful and see you in the next video. Bye for now.